Good morning. I am Baron Bozeman, president of Collin County Master Gardeners Association. And on behalf of the nearly 400 members of our association, I would like to welcome you to our very first summer speaker series lecture. I am joined this morning by our immediate past president and recently announced Master Gardener of the Year, Edie Fife. She is multi-talented and as she is also serving as our technical director for this call. Our program director, Joyce Warren is with us. Our Speakers Bureau co-lead, Lisa McNeil. And finally, Jenny Nelson, the driving force behind this summer speaker series. Also join us are our colleagues from the Tarrant County Master Gardener Association, Nancy Curl, Teresa Thomas, Pat Higgins, and Dick Pafford. Without their guidance and assistance, we would never have been able to pull this off. Thank you, guys. Additionally, I would like to give a shout out to the Tarrant County Water District for their continued support of AgriLife educational programs. I just have a couple of uh, housekeeping announcements before the uh, lecture this morning. Uh, during the webinar, your video, microphones, and chat functions will be turned off. Not to worry, you will still have the capability to ask questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Please ask only questions that are related to the subject at hand and relatable to all. All questions will be addressed as time allows. A full Q&A is scheduled at the end of the presentation. Remember, we are all here to learn, so please be courteous. One last thing, within a week, you will receive an email containing a link allowing access to Jared's presentation. Additionally, there will be a survey that we encourage you to fill out. This will assist us in making future, future webinars even better. With that, I would like to ask our programs director, Joyce Warren, to introduce our guest speaker for today. Joyce? Thank you, Baron. Dr. Jared Barnes is one of our nation's top academic horticulturists. He inspires fellow gardeners to learn about what is useful and new in contemporary horticulture. As a professor, Dr. Barnes is blessed to travel the country and the world learning about new plants and how to use them. And then he carries that knowledge back to share with students and fellow gardeners. In this presentation, he will focus on lessons learned that are applicable to the Southeast and Texas. Dr. Barnes started gardening when he was five years old. Since then, he has enthusiastically pursued how best to cultivate plants and cultivate minds. He currently fulfills those passions as an award-winning Associate Professor of Horticulture at Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches. He also hosts the Plant fantastic podcast and writes a weekly newsletter entitled Plant Ed. He obtained his doctorate in horticultural science from North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. He interned the summer of 2008 at the Scott Arboretum of Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. He has traveled around the United States and into 11 countries to gain a broad understanding of horticulture. His per fresh perspectives and writing have been shared in many national publications and programs. Thank you for kicking off our series today, Jared. We are ready to travel with you. Well, thank you, Joyce, and thank you all for welcoming me this morning for this great presentation. Uh, is, are we good to go? Everybody can see me? And let me go ahead and share my slides so everybody can see. Yes, just want to double check and make sure with moderators we're good to go. Looks great. Okay. Yep. All right, thank you so much. So again, I wanna say thank you all uh, to the Collin County Master Gardeners for inviting me to do this, and especially uh, Jenny Price Nelson for reaching out and asking me to do this presentation. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about travels around the world uh, here in the US and also abroad in my lecture, The Traveling Plantsman. Again, uh, I've got an hour to present. And then of course, as I mentioned, we'll do Q&A at the very end. But if you got questions, feel free to go ahead and post them in the chat. So my story starts in Tennessee. I have been gardening since I was five years old. So this is a photograph of me hoeing my corn and tomatoes out. Look at that smile, still smiling. 
I was a lot thinner there. I've eaten a lot more ice cream since I was four or five years old. So, uh, but now that, you know, I've grown up, I'm so blessed that I'm now able to be a horticulture professor here at Stephen F. Austin State University. So this is a glimpse into the plantry. The plantry is our student botanic garden on campus where I am the director. And it's about an acre and a half located here around and behind the agriculture building. So we're always trying to think of ways that we can teach students about how to grow plants. Uh, for now, we've mainly been focusing on annuals and edibles, but we're starting to branch out and start to focus on growing perennials and natives as well, too. So you're going to be seeing more of that um, later on in the future from us. Uh, as I mentioned, I do like to teach students about how to teach and uh, grow plants in contemporary horticulture. So for example, uh, these are students, uh, Mike and Hannah here, who are planting out plants into our gravel garden. Uh, talk a little bit more about gravel gardens later on, but the idea is, is that you plant plants in four to five inches of grit or gravel. They root through that and it helps to reduce weed growth on top. And so we planted these in the spring, and this is what that planting looked like later on that fall with the asters and the muley grass and others uh, coming into full autumn glory there. Uh, this is the front of our agriculture building. So we've got a lot of Leatris and Rebecca. So again, kind of one of these naturalistic plantings where we have grasses that provide a lower matrix and then other things that erupt up out of there. We've recently redone the back of that. So it's a little bit less tropical. And again, trying to pay, play off this uh, rustic farm aesthetic that we're going for in the plantry for our design. And this is just kind of a little bit of a preview of what's coming. Uh, we actually got a $30,000 grant to build a native plant trial garden right here at the back corner of the plantry. So my students and I have been working on building steps for the past couple of weeks. And so what we're going to do is do terracing off either side and then start to trial and evaluate native plants in this 7,000 square foot area. So a lot of cool stuff coming out from us here in the plantry and horticulture program. Uh, in the agriculture department, you know, I'm centered in the ag department here at SFA. A lot of cool stuff coming out of here from us. The other thing, too, is, is that not only do I garden here on campus, but also garden at home. So this is a snapshot of my garden this past spring. Uh, so we live about 20 minutes outside of town. Uh, my wife and I helped manage this, and we call our garden Ephemera Farm. Uh, we call it Ephemera Farm because we like to celebrate the little moments in light. Uh, in life, whether it's, you know, that first beam of sunlight that comes in the morning or a pollinator that flits through or, you know, some of those special moments that you encounter in gardens. So uh, we were very humbled that uh, someone came and visit our garden this past spring uh, working on it for a book. And they commented that our garden was the one that they had visited that had the most pollinator and insect activity. So I think that shows me that, you know, we're really trying to figure out a way to bring ecology back into gardens and have places where people can still enjoy it and still have that beauty that we love. So I want to start off talking about my experiences in horticulture and travels and trips and uh, places that I've lived that have had prominent experiences on me. So I'm going to talk about, you know, some places that I've been early on. Then I'm going to take us around the country, showing us various different places and around the world, showing us very different uh, various experiences that I've learned and seen that we can then use in our gardens. So growing up, this was basically, you know, just right down the road from our house uh, in West Tennessee. So I grew up in a very rural agricultural area. Our nearest neighbor was half a mile away. And, you know, growing up in that area, I was always searching for nature, looking for nature, looking for wildflowers out exploring. And I was so blessed that, you know, my family took us on road trips to go see, like, for example, the Great Smoky Mountains, uh, to go there and see the diversity of plants plants that 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 area offer was just tremendous you know the Smoky Mountains is definitely a diversity hotspot plant wise for us in the country and you know for me to go and see plants and wildflowers like you know this foam flower growing on a nurse log how cool is that you know to be able to see that plants are so resilient they can grow on top of a tree and just keep surviving and thriving. And so some of these early experiences of seeing these plants growing in the wild and then going to areas like Cades Cove, you know, some of these early uh, naturalistic type landscapes uh, influenced me early on. It really made me appreciate and think about how plants actually grow in nature in some of more of these wilder areas. And so to go there in autumn, again, with my family and experience uh, these wide open spaces with the mountains behind was just quite beautiful and stunning. And so, you know, in these places, we can see a lot of the plants that we have in our gardens and uh, that we have around us. For example, in this 
grassland you actually see emerging up out of there those are sweet gums and i know sweet gums are kind of a trash tree uh it's kind of funny when you go over to europe you see sweet gums being sold for like 120 150 euros uh you know so they really value them over there but you know for us it's kind of a trash tree but just to see how they are growing here coppice where you go in and maybe mow it once a year once every other years trying to think about how we use native plants or use plants differently, uh, going out and seeing plants in the wild, that really provides you an opportunity to help better understand the plants that we're trying to grow in the landscapes, how we can use them in different ways, where they actually need to be growing, ways that we can modify our environment to grow them. And if you look at the mountains behind, I was very blessed in graduate school to actually go up on those mountaintops to Gregory Bald. And Gregory Bald, if you've never been there, uh, the description was that, uh, you know, before you die, you need to hike up here and try to see this. Because what it is, is that a massive collection of azaleas. There's different theories about how it actually came to be. One theory is Mr. Gregory actually uh, brought his cows up to pasture many years ago before the Smokies became a national park but brought these azaleas up here so that that way they could grow and survive. And if you look in the distance behind, you actually see Cade's Cove. Um, so where I was standing, taking that photograph, looking up towards that mountaintop. But, you know, I know that we see azaleas a lot of times here in East Texas. Uh, you know, I know further north, north towards Dallas, y'all can struggle, we could do to high pH issues on them. But, you know, we're used to seeing them around a lot of evergreens planted in that way. But honestly, I think they look quite natural and beautiful just here with this grass matrix underneath. And whenever I said that there's a massive collection of azaleas, I wasn't kidding. You know, just all kinds of colors, all kinds of shades, dominantly sort of that, you know, orangey red coloration. But to go out and see that, you know, sometimes I think massing is frowned upon in horticulture, but to go out and see some of these native environments where plants are growing in mass, on mass, you know, where there's plentiful numbers of them, I was really touching as a young horticulturist. Between undergrad, uh, where I did my uh, degree at University of Tennessee at Martin, and graduate school, where I went for uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, NC State, I actually went up and did an uh, internship at the Scott Arboretum. And the Scott Arboretum was a great place for me to really cut my teeth on horticulture because, you know, it's definitely one of the most beautiful campuses in the country. This is the Cunningham House where the horticulture program is housed. So this is what it looks like in the fall. And again, these are plants that we can grow, like Raiden's favorite aster. It's one of my favorite plants for fall color. You've got some little blue stems and stuff erupting up out of there as well too. But again, using these in mass is a nice ground cover there underneath this cedrus, uh, this Deodor cedar looks quite beautiful in the fall. And again, it's a very effective. I know sometimes we want just one of these in our landscape, but why not plant 20 or 30 of them and have them be billowy purple later on in the fall? One of the things too I loved about being at the Scott Arboretum was how they did their container displays. So, you know, I think sometimes when we plant a container, we think about doing one pot, but instead oftentimes they would do maybe 20 or 30 in a grouping with again, one of these similar color themes like you see here, there's kind of this terracotta orange pink yellow woven throughout these planting that they've done in containers. And, you know, this idea kind of came from Great Dixter that I'm going to talk about later where you can put plants in pots and then just change them out to the displays as you need to. And so you can have some fun with this as you're growing and it allows you to experiment and try with plants, putting plants close together and seeing what grows well. Uh, the other thing too at the Scott Arboretum that I became aware of is this idea of trying to grow plants as sustainably as possible. This is their rose garden and the rose garden is one of the prettiest uh, gardens on campus, especially in May, early June. And one of the cool traditions they have is, is that the students that are on this campus when they go for graduation, they actually get to walk through the rose garden and pick out a rose that is then pinned to their graduation gown before they go to graduate. So it's a really cool tradition they have. But as you know, with roses, they take a lot of care and maintenance and a lot of times spraying. This rose garden is uh, organically managed. So that means that they're not spraying anything harmful, deleterious, et cetera. What they've done is, is that they've really started to phase out broad collections of roses started to phase in more different plants that are going to help to attract pollinators, beneficial insects. And the other thing too that they've done is, is that they've really started to capitalize on using disease resistant roses, you know, because rose rosette is a big issue. And so they're very active in managing this. And to me, you know, I think this looks quite beautiful and it really shows you how with a change of mindset, how you can start trying to grow plants differently. Also, being there helps me experience how people think about horticulture. So this is Jeff Jabko. He's the grounds manager there. 
And what he's talking about is how on the back side of this rose garden is actually trellising for their clematis collection. So he was talking about how there was a committee that they formed to basically think through how they were going to actually have clematises be able to grow up that uh, structure because clematises a lot of times will have tendrils or uh, other types of growing arrangements that they need to be able to grow on those. So they actually welded it so that if you look, there's kind of some ridges that come off of it. But just that attention to detail in horticulture is something that I was able to learn and experience there. The other thing too is it's a beautiful campus of uh, going back again in the wintertime to see it more uh, bare. Uh, this is of course on the left, their amphitheater that they have where they host graduation and other events in. It was designed to sort of just have this cathedral type effect. Those are tulip poplars there, of course, a wonderful native tree. And then on the right, you know, one of the lessons you learn in horticulture is you can espalier almost anything. And so this is an espaliered witch hazel. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a non-native. You know, you could do one of our native witch hazel and espalier that against a building. But one of the things that I took away also from the Scudder Breedum is their love for uh, sustainability, their love for trying to make their environment as good as possible. So this is a new science center that they just built within the past few years, and they had a tree that unfortunately died right next to it. And so what they did is they just basically came in, cut it up, and they made a stumpery. Now, this is not permanent. This is ephemeral. This is, of course, going to decay over time. But again, this idea of creating habitats where we can have not only people come out and experience it, but also other beneficial insects, you know, that's going to be the future of horticulture trying to figure out a way that we can all live together here on the face of the planet. Other things about sustainability that they talked about and I learned about was that, you know, they're also very interested in stormwater management. And so if you look here, you see, of course, this prairie drop seed matrix with some dianthus and some alliums, some onions coming up out of those. But what you don't see is just that this is planted into a grit base. And underneath this is a cistern because this area on campus floods frequently, water comes through here. And so what happens is, is that as the water moves over this space, it goes down into that gravel base, continues on into the cistern, and then eventually it slowly recharges the nearby creek. So again, thinking about how we can use plants for green, what we call green infrastructure, this idea that we can use plants in cities and urban areas to help us mitigate problems and challenges we face was a novel concept that I learned about there at the Scott Arboretum. And then of course, uh, continuing on, there we go. Continue on. Uh, one of the things, too, I learned about at the Scudder Breedum, I was talking earlier about gravel gardening, is this idea of planting plants into gravel and grit. And so this is a concept that came from Germany in the 1980s, where what they were trying to do is they were trying to integrate plants into urban areas, but they wanted to reduce the maintenance that that required. So what they did is they put down a grit base and then planted plants into that about uh, four to five, six inches. In some cases, they go deeper, but a good four to six inch layer of gravel, plant plugs into that. The plugs will root down into the soil beneath. But one of the things that this helps to prevent is weed growth on top. Plant growth is a little bit slower in this. But again, once these plants get established, because a lot of these plants are used to growing in very drought tolerant, uh, more gravelly soils like you see here, there's Leatris, Coreopsis, there's uh, orange milkweed, there's Baptisia in the back that of course have finished flowering. You can do these style plantings to really help to reduce your maintenance level. And so this is kind of where our prototype gravel planting came from here at the plantry is seeing these other gravel gardens around the country. And then, of course, another green infrastructure thing that they have is green roofs. It's harder for us to do green roofs down here in the south because a lot of the plants that they use further north aren't able to deal with our heat. It is possible. You know, there's uh, some trials and stuff that have been going on different places, but it's just a little bit harder. But still to think about how people are using plants in really creative ways to try to, again, mitigate issues. For example, green roofs, they, you know, keep the building roof membrane lasting longer because a lot of times that sunlight will degrade the plastic layer. They also help to hold water on site. So green roofs a lot of times can hold up to an inch of rainfall. But just, you know, seeing this thinking about how we can use plants in really creative ways to solve problems, this is a great place to go and learn about plants.
And then, of course, I did graduate school at NC State. And uh, a lot of times after I finished my work, I would go out in the evenings to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. And I would then uh, go and just walk the paths, walk, learn about plants. And this is where I really started building my library of plant knowledge, you know, seeing how things grow, seeing how things matured and changed. Because I was there for six years and I was able to walk. And so, for example, this long perennial border, uh, you know, goes through different color themes and stuff. Like here on this end, they've got kind of this contrasting yellow and uh, uh, purple blue and then as you get further towards the other end it tends to uh, become more purples and then onto pinks and reds but there were some really cool plants i learned about there at the arboretum like salix flame which is one of my favorite plants i've got some of these growing here in texas one of the things i love about it is it has this silvery green foliage and then what a you know, the number one reason I grow it, though, is, is that uh, the stems, of course, will start to turn a nice orange color later in the season. And then once uh, the leaves drop off, they're just a brilliant, brilliant orange coloration that you see there. Also, you know, some natives that we have here in the uh, more southwest part of the area, Mexican buckeye, you know, they had that growing there in their scree gravel garden where they were evaluating and trialing plants that need more drought tolerant type conditions. So, you know, I learned about that plant there. And then also another one, too, this one was introduced by by, uh, our friend Greg Grant, Big Mama. This is Malva viscous, so it's one of the larger types of Turks cap that grows. So, you know, that was really cool to see this plant that originally came from one of my dear friends now in Texas. Uh, it was growing there at the Arboretum. And then the Arboretum also has some really cool funky stuff. This is one you don't see a lot in the trade, but when you do, it's really draw some eyes and stares. This is uh, Cornus Florida subspecies Urbiniana. It's a it's a dogwood that hails from the rain for uh, the cloud forest of Mexico where they actually have fused bracts uh, instead of being fully open like ours do here more in the southeast. So again, it was a great place to go and learn and see about plants and get some of those early experiences. So now I'm going to take us around the country and also around the world learning about inspiration from other gardens because we've got a lot of gardens to look at today. So as we're going through these, I want us to think about four friends that we can think about when we're doing garden design. And these four friends came from research that Rachel and Stephen Kaplan did as professors at the University of Michigan, where basically they were asking the question, how is it that when a person enters an area outside of the environment, how do they experience that area? And what they found was is that we can kind of boil this down to four first principles. The first one is what we call coherence. And coherence is where you can walk into a space and try to understand it and immediately see it and try to perceive what is going on. And so in this planting behind you, you can see that we've got a lot of cool colors, uh, pinks, purples. We got, our, of course, our native Agastache. We've got native Gara as well too there. So the idea is, is that, you know, there's something going on here that's purposeful. There's something here that sort of unites this area. And we can do that with color, with texture, with repeating elements in a garden. Next up is legibility. Legibility is another thing that people need to perceive in a landscape to better understand it. And so, you know, like you see here at Le Jardin Plume, which is the feather garden in France, uh, you know, if this was just an unmowed area, you know, it wouldn't have a lot of what we call legibility, readability. But instead, what they've done is they've gone in and they've mowed these perfect squares in this orchard area. And again, I love how they've repeated the squares around the trees. We have this legibility. We can tell that there's something being done here that's purposeful. So coherence and legibility allow us to understand and want to engage with the landscape. And then once we've got these two, we then are able to build complexity in. Complexity is where we enter a landscape and we don't get bored. There's something always to look at. Like, for example, here at the Great Border, um, the Long Border at Great Dixter. And so this idea that, you know, having complexity in a garden or a landscape, when people come, they experience it, they always have something different to look at. They always see uh, different levels of things to perceive. And the other thing, too, that coherence and legibility allow us to perceive is mystery. This sense that we don't know what's around the corner. We don't know what's behind that hill. Uh, like, so you see here at Chanticleer, there's this sense of mystery here in the gravel garden at the base of this ruin. And so this ruin, we don't know what's by it behind there. We don't know if there's another garden or something. And so it wants us to, it forces us to want to explore this more. So as we're going through these gardens, let's keep these four friends, uh, these four first principles of how we perceive gardens and landscapes in mind, coherence, legibility, complexity, and mystery. And if you're designing a garden, you can really try to make it so that that way you 
you can definitely uh, engage with it and design gardens better as well too. So the first one I want to talk about is Chanticleer. It's here in the U.S. Chanticleer is one of the best botanic gardens, in my opinion. Most people you talk to, it's in their top three as far as ones they've visited. And it's just really hard to explain why, but to me, it's just basically a place where horticulture has been allowed to roam free. And there's just so many incredible artistic abilities that people have. So here you see the teacup garden and we go into our Zoom picture. I mean, just look at that. Isn't that rich? You know, there's so much complexity and coherence that goes into this planting here that you see. Or again, we've got some of these tropical bromeliads and we've got, you know, some of these variegated kale and other grasses, you know, we're using Little, these little short grasses kind of provide a more naturalistic feel to this planting. This is their vegetable garden and beyond. This is the cut flower garden that you see here. And I just love how there's a sense of whimsy that you see in this uh, vegetable garden. They've built these little uh, carrot-like bamboo structures that you see, or carrot wood structures that you see here. And if you look closely, you can see little peas that have been trellised up those structures. And then, of course, then behind, you've got that beautiful, those arches in the cut flower garden. Again, Again, we don't know what that's at the end of that pathway. We see that bench in the distance, but it forces us to want to go explore. And then, of course, I've already shown this picture, but again, back to the ruin and the gravel garden, you know, seeing this mix of different native perennials here. So we've got Mexican feathergrass, we've got echinacea, we've got orange milkweed. The white thing that you see sort of scattered around, that's, of course, uh, wild quinine, uh, parthenium. So it's just a blending. And if you notice, too, we've only got a few main plants that are taking center stage here right now. So we've got some complexity, but we've also got some coherence where we perceive it. And, you know, earlier I was asking the question, what is behind this plant? What is behind this ruin back here? And so when you go behind, you see that actually part of this ruin is they've got this table that they have filled up with water and it's reflecting pools so you can enjoy that succulent, uh, that succulent mantle there on that old faux chimney. As we continue exploring Chanticleer, one of my favorite parts is the elevated uh, walkway that they have recently done within the past, I'd say, 10 or so years. And so what they wanted to do was basically create an ADA accessible pathway. And they've came, come in and planted this with a very rich tapestry of plants. And a lot of these, again, are native to Texas. Like, you know, you see the Rebecca Maxima. We've got Echinacea in here as well, too. If you look closely, there's some little uh, Aragorostis that are down along the base as well, too. Some purple love grass that are growing there. And just to enjoy the complexity and just the, the theme of this sort of cool color planting that they have here. Again, uh, on the right side is one of my favorite echinaceas, Echinacea tennesseensis. You know, I'm a Tennessee homeboy, so I've got to throw out my favorite echinacea there. Um, but one of the things I love about that plant is, is that you can always tell that it's an Echinacea tennesseensis because the blooms face east uh, in the morning. And so that I think that's a good motto to live life, you know, always be facing sunrise uh, and facing the day. A little bit lower down on the elevated walkway, you can see again, they've got that Mexican feather grass. They've got those bowl leaves there uh, coming up of that Silphium terebinthinaceum. So, you know, we were talking earlier about complexity. We can talk about complexity of textures, having bowl leaves against something that's more grassy in area uh, like those Mexican feather grasses. So this is the view that you see whenever you actually look down on the elevated uh, walkway. So I took this photograph in June and I was fortunate enough to go back up there in October and give a talk in that area. And this is a photograph in October. So you can see we still have some structure that we had early in the season, like for example, the Rebecca Maxima, the, the giant coneflower that's in the foreground of this, uh, both of these images, you can see how it lasts, but you can see how other things have kind of faded away. But what has of course taken presence is this beautiful airy muley grass um, that they have planted planted en masse in this planting. And I mean, just look at that. I mean, this is just so simple. I mean, there's only two or three plants here, but yet the complexity here that we have and the, the, the difference in that feathery airiness and of course those little balls of Eryngium, a rattlesnake master emerging out of this. This is, I've learned too, is a very polarizing image because I'll show this in classes and I'll ask students, what do you think? And I'd say nine out of 10 say, I love this. This is great, you know, because it almost feels like you're flying through some futuristic city in the clouds. And, you know, there's a couple of people, though, that they don't like this, and that's okay. And one of the reasons they may not like this is because, you know, after the dew melts off, 
you know, this is what you see and it just doesn't have that same effect. So this is about a uh, same photo taken two, three hours apart. It just doesn't have that same effect. So again, that's sort of the mystery of gardens that we experience them at different times, have different experiences. And, you know, that's one of the things that keeps me wanting to go out every day to see what's new. Now, I realize I've shown you a lot of color at Chanticleer, but keep in mind that it's nice to have quiet areas in the garden. We were talking earlier about legibility, and you can do something that's quite easy to make something legible, you know, to make it seem like something's pur purposeful. A sitting area where they've gone in and done some bamboo strips into the grass, they've left some of the grass a little bit taller so they don't mow it for, again, you know, maybe some native insects, and then the rest of it, they keep mowed so people can experience it. So it doesn't all have to be rich color. You know, you can do something simple like this, too. At Stonely, uh, Stonely is one of our nation's newest botanic gardens. It's only been formed within the past seven, eight years or so. But one of the unique things about Stonely is, is that they are a 100% native plant garden, minus the le uh, minus the trees that were already on site and stuff, you know, maybe some of the tricolor beaches and stuff. Their main focus is to, to go 100% natives in their landscape installations. So that's a bold claim, right? But part of the reason why they want to do that is they want to say, you know, instead of being a 70 or 80% native native landscape were 100 percent and so when you go visit stonely you know right from the parking lot you see that they've got natives as well as ecological plants in mind as well too so what they have here is they have uh things like um pacara which of course is a great native spring wildflower planted in this uh rain catchment area as water sort of flows towards that center um, of that parking lot uh, if you look across the parking, you'll see two, you'll see a mast over there. They've got some beautiful Pensamen digitalis. Of course, it's a great native. We grow it here in East Texas. Uh, grows up and down some of the roadsides as well, too. I think that's one of the things we don't appreciate sometimes enough with our natives is, is that a lot of times they need to be used in large numbers uh, so that we can just really appreciate how effective they can be. Once you enter into the landscape at Stonely, you can start to see that they're employing this grass matrix approach you know, planting a layer of sedges so that other plants can come up and erupt out of that. The idea is, is that instead of using mulch, we're using plants and replacing those uh, that mulch with plants, uh, which is, again, a great novel concept to provide habitat for organisms. A little bit closer to the house, you know, you've got a native Styrax americanus, uh, one of these little short uh, shrubby type small trees that has these beautiful white flowers on it. And I think sometimes, you know, people think, oh, well, you should just do meatballs or something here. But honestly, sometimes when you've got some of these hard lines against the uh, house, maybe you want something a little bit softer to kind of soften some of those hard lines. Of course, we do still have some structure and complexity to this landscape at Stonely. These are some of these Taylor upright genus virginiana of course you know our native eastern red cedar grows great up and down all kinds of roadsides you know interstate lanes but this is a more upright form of it that was selected it does kind of get some of that browning uh, that can be an issue but nevertheless it's still a great selection of one of our native eastern red cedars and one of the things too i loved at stonely is trying to embrace natives in unique ways this is a course where they used to have a pool and they filled it in because they were worried about the hazards because they're open every day of the year and what they did here is they instead came in and they planted bog gardens so you can see a lot of our native pitcher plants growing here and one of the things that i love about having these pitcher plants is is that you know they kind of mimic this hedge this upright hedge in the back so you've got these upright pitcher plants growing in these bog gardens and these upright plants growing in the back in that hedge you can kind of see that repeating element again creating a coherence in this landscape and so this is their arbor along down along one side. So this is, again, 100% native plant arbor. You can look and you see they've got things like Agastache. Uh, back in the back, they've got a great native hibiscus. This is uh, Lufkin Red. And so this is uh, one of their native hibiscuses that grow. And of course, some of you who are from Texas will recognize the name Lufkin um, because it was a plant that was uh, used in a breeding program. They found uh, a local type of hibiscus that had a little bit more disease resistance, and so they used that in the breeding program. But still beautiful sort of pinkish red flowers blooming on this wonderful hibiscus there in the landscape. 
And then, of course, traveling to other places throughout the uh, U.S., one of my other favorite gardens that I've been to here in the southeast is Gibbs Garden. This is just about an hour north of Atlanta. Uh, in 2013, my, uh, I was talking to my mom and dad, and my mom said that Southern Living had profiled this new botanic garden that was going to be opening uh, just north of Atlanta called Gibbs Garden. It was going to be prominent because they had millions and millions of daffodils planted there. And so, uh, you know, I joke that, you know, if, if any of you want my mom to come visit, just have a profile. In, in Southern Garden or Southern Living, and mom and dad are on here today, so she's going to hear that too. But uh, it's great uh, because whenever we got there, I told mom and dad, I said, you know, we've got to get there early because I've been to these botanic gardens. I know how crazy they can get. We get there and there's only three cars in the parking lot, so we had our whole we had the whole place to ourselves for a couple of hours, which was glorious. But this is a whole high, hillside of narcissus, and I realize narcissus is not a native plant, um, but you know, it's one of those durable plants that we can grow here in Texas in the southeast, um, and so. Some of, sometimes we have to consider chilling requirements. Um, but nevertheless, you know, there is definitely the sense of coherence on the, this hillside where they've used these plants en masse. And if you think this is a lot of narcissus, it goes on and on and on. So the hillside I just showed you is actually in the distance. And so you've got this whole valley here just filled with narcissus. And it's just spectacular to go see all these. And I love how they've used them in creative ways in the landscape, like here along the ponds. So you get that reflection. I think too often, if we've got a little water garden, we don't use reflection enough in horticulture. Or I love too how they kind of blended these colors together. You know, sometimes our native plants like beaches or some of our native maples will hold on to their leaves and the wintertime, and they're actually playing off the cup color of the narcissus with the foliage and the trees above. And again, just trying to do small little things like that to create coherence in gardens uh, is a really wonderful way that you can sort of play off your artistic side a little bit more. Gibbs Gardens not only features, though, uh, of course, daffodils, but they also have an uh, incredible uh, um, Asian garden on the back side of the property. So it's definitely more formal. Uh, some parts have more of a simplistic type design, like you see here on the left side. They've got that dwarf mondo with rhodia uh, planted, sort of coming up out of there. Some nice clean lines from Ogon, a, a chorus grass. And then, of course, back in the background, you see that we've got some complexity with different shapes and structures, but definitely a very peaceful effect um, at this garden. Going abroad, one of the best botanic gardens that I have visited in the entire world is Le Jardin Plume. And then to call it a botanic garden is a little bit loose because really it's only managed by three people, a husband and wife and a gardener that helps them on the side. But one of the reasons I love Le Jardin Plume is it's just, you know, those four principles that we talked about earlier, uh, they really imbue them so well at this garden. So, you know, this is just at the entrance here. Uh, they also run a nursery and sell plants on the side. But once you walk through that gate, again, sort of eliciting some mystery in the garden, you come out and you see that they have these beautiful hedges that have been designed and clipped perfectly. I mean, just it looks like waves on the sea undulating. And if you go behind these hedges, what you see is, is that there's actually this more naturalistic perennial garden behind. And so as you're designing gardens, one of the tricks that you can use if you want to see if it has good complexity and if you have good texture in a garden is to make a photograph black and white. Because what you do is whenever you make a, a color uh, photograph black and white, you take the color out and you're able to see the shapes that reside in that garden. And so, you know, we still have something interesting to look at, even though we've taken that color out of it. And again, like I was talking about earlier, one of the ways they achieve legibility is they mow pathways around this grass. You know, if you looked at this, some of you say like this looks unkempt. This looks, you know, doesn't look good because it looks too wild. There might be a snake in there, or ticks or something like that. But because they've gone in and they've mowed these edges around here, it shows us that they're doing something purposeful. And again, creating a sense of coherence here. They're repeating the same design element of these uh, squares, not only in the patches of grass, but also around the bases of these apple trees in this old orchard. And again, look at that hedge in the background. Now, some of you may think, well, we can't really do that here in Texas. And I don't know, you know, Yopon Holly is pretty tough. You know, you might be able to do that, um, especially with some of these Yopons, uh, maybe some of the more dwarf types shaping them. Uh, if you're curious how they do it too, they have uh, printout forms. They've cut pieces out of wood. So they just get those out and every, every couple of months, they'll just trim it back so that it maintains that shape. 
And look at those lines. I mean, is that not spectacular? This is a little bit up closer to the house where they have some boxwood hedges. But look at just how well designed that is, where the boxwood hedge lines just keep going out into perpetuity out into the orchard area. Just, I mean, that's just, as a horticulturist, you know, that gives me the chills seeing how well that is designed. And again, this is just three people managing this space, which is amazing. And again, we were talking about coherence earlier. One of the ways they create coherence is, again, this repeat of the square throughout their property. So not only do you have squares around the grass, squares around the trees, but if you look closely, that pond is also a square. And so again, this is creating a sense of coherence, but complexity too, because we've got different, we've got the same shape used in different ways. And that's one of the ways you can do that. And then you go behind a hedge, no more squares. Instead, we have these jolly round mound boxwood hedges with some of their, again, native wildflowers coming up out of them. So, you know, we could do this with, you know, something like blue bonnets or gallardia or rebecca here. You know, it doesn't have to be columbines like you see back there in the back. Um, it could be something totally different that we could do to make it seem more fun and interesting. So, again, sort of a, an interesting way to create complexity, having different shapes and different parts of a garden as well, too. We also, on our trip to France, went to Monet's Garden. And Monet's Garden, of course, um, you know, you know, many of you will know Monet for his water lilies. And so I loved visiting Monet's Garden because, one, it's color rich, very color rich. But also, you get to see basically where Monet painted. You get to sort of go out there and experience it. And you hear the dedication to the garden that he had. You know, he would have workers go out in the morning and pick leaves up out of the water so that he had a clean, pristine place to uh, paint. Another thing too that touched me about him is that, and it's probably his own selfish reasons, but he actually paved the road that runs past his property. He offered to pave that for the city because he was tired of all the dust getting kicked up and then depositing on the plants around it. So again, messing up those colors that he was trying to perceive and paint so well. So if you go to Monet's garden, of course, some of you may have seen this in English uh, or uh, excuse me, English, in European garden design books. This is of course this uh, famous uh, a lay that they have here with the arbors over it. A lot of times during the summertime, they'll allow nasturtiums and other plants to grow out in the center of that pathway. So it again softens those harsh edges. But you know, one of the things you perceive at Monet's garden is again, it is a garden designed for color. So you've got typically a color pattern that uh, appears. So like in the image on the left, we go from yellow to oranges to reds to purples behind. And then actually, if you keep walking this pathway, it goes and eventually into blues and and purples. Uh, over here on the right image, again, it kind of is similar where we're, uh, it's more of a contrasting color where we're planting plants that have different colors so that they play off of each other quite well. But one of the things, though, again, about focusing on color is we were talking earlier about uh, the feather garden, Le Jardin Plume, about texture. You know, this is a beautiful path with these irises here. But if you take away the color, there's not as much to look at. So again, this is a great way that you who are doing garden designs can test and see, you know, is your garden missing something? Take a photograph and turn it black and white. Hillside. Hillside is definitely uh, was an incredible experience for when we went there last summer on a trip to the UK. Hillside is the private garden of Dan Pearson and Hugh Morgan. Uh, they do an incredible job. Dan, of course, is a very famous garden designer. He's uh, won awards at Chelsea, the uh, famous flower show over in the UK. So we got to spend some time with Dan. This is Dan so, uh, standing in a um, wildflower planting. So we've got Cosmos and Amy Magus here and some uh, some late season barley wheat that's erupting up out of there. And he's talking to us about how, you know, this is an area that's going to eventually be designed to turn into something different. But for now, they wanted to have this incredible display there. And of course, this is one of my favorite photographs of my wife that I've taken. This is my wife, Karen. So you can see here immersed, <laughs> you know, so she's about five, eight. And I mean, these wildflowers are up to her head, but just again, having this sense of mystery and exploration in the landscape uh, so that you can walk through it. But one of the things about, you know, uh, Dan and Hugh's landscape is, is that, you know, you can tell that they love this place and they are trying to cultivate it and engage with it as much as they possibly can. So again, we were talking about legibility earlier. We had this single pathway leading down. We can't see where it goes, but we know it has to go somewhere because there's that single pathway mode on that grass side hill uh, on the opposite hill. And just that simple act of mowing that hillside creates just a new dynamic within that landscape that encourages to explore. 
Dan, whenever he took us into this perennial planting, he took us in what he called the calm way. And so there's a lot of purples and blues and silvers that are there. Like, for example, you know, they had Rigucci clematis. Uh, this is a clematis that grows great for me here in East Texas. Uh, it starts flowering in April. It's still flowering for me now. It'll peter out a little bit in August, but then it'll come back in the fall and flower some more. But they just have it growing up through some branches that they've stuck in the ground. And then you turn the corner around to go back and suddenly your your eyes are just saturated with this yellow uh this yellow from these different plants like you know the tall digitalis and some of the uh some of the daylilies that are starting to bloom there these are actually night flowering daylilies that they have on this hillside so that's something gertrude jekyll who's of course a famous garden designer back in the um uh, about 100 years ago, one of the tricks that she would do is she would take people down a pathway of blues and purples round the corner, and suddenly you'd hit with these golds and these yellows, and your eye just craves that difference in color um, based on how we're perceiving those colors in the landscape. And so it's really an interesting way to create an interesting dynamic in the landscape. And of course, you know, if you have a pathway mown on a hillside, you have to go explore. And so go up there, and then when you turn around and look back, you of course see this beautiful beautiful perennial garden. Again, the cools, the blues, and the purples on one side, and then the yellows and the reds and the oranges on one side. So sort of a color gradient through the space. Again, different forms and shapes and, and structures and textures that we have here, really playing off of those four principles that we talked about at the very beginning. Humalo, of course, is the a, a very famous garden because it was uh, the property of Pete Aldoff. And so uh, in 2013, 10 years ago, I got the chance to go there and visit. And so for me, this was, you know, an incredible experience to go and explore this. I wasn't able to meet with him that day because he was busy, but to go and see how he's designed it. Of course, a lot of you have seen Five Seasons, uh, the gardens of Pete Aldoff, so you'll recognize this. But one of the things that was interesting is just walking through the pathways, exploring the garden, seeing the dynamism, seeing how he really does use that grass matrix to make things look like it's a wildflower planting that you know you might see in the Ozarks or the Smokies or you know somewhere else maybe in the prairies of Kansas you know exploring uh, and this is actually out front so again dominantly using some of grasses and what was cool is you know he was not afraid to use some of our natives here like Amsonia and Baptisia you know he wasn't afraid to use some of those in the landscape one of the things though that I first saw there was that uh, you know Pete actually had a trial garden back at the back part of his property of course Humilo used to be a famous nursery and has since graded more into design work now but he had a garden back at the back where he was able to evaluate and see how plants grow. And I think that that's sometimes something we miss in our gardens is we don't trial and evaluate them enough. We don't, we don't see how plants are going to grow until we actually put them into the landscape. And so I've also had the opportunity to go and visit other places that Pete Outoff has designed, like, for example, Outoff Field. I just, actually just did a blog post on this this past weekend, but we got to go see this. It's near Bath in the UK. So if you ever get a chance to go, it's beautiful at Hauser and Worth Somerset. And so, you know, you walk into the art gallery. It's very quiet here in this little cloister garden that he designed. A lot of grasses, some perennials like Karinga Shoma erupting up out of there, again, with more bolder foliage. But then you walk out and this is what you see. And it's just glorious to see how Pete has such a sense about how to use plants in different ways. And there's some of our natives here, like Echinacea. Way in the back is Joe Pieweed. Uh, way in the back is also Philippendula. So, you know, some of these native plants that we love and adore here in the United States, you know, using them again in blocks of color uh, for design is very applicable. And again, like I said, you know, not everything has to be wild and crazy. You know, sometimes having a quiet area like you see here, this is actually a wetland garden where they're using more grasses and more uh, sort of calmer colors, you know, is also very effective as you're exiting out of this art gallery. So having a little bit simplistic, more color design there um, as you exit that. We were talking earlier about the repetition of shapes and structures. So one of the things that I like, too, is just that, you know, you kind of have a break from the planting with this gravelly area out here with these little circle islands of turf grass. And then beyond, we, of course, have this fiber uh, fiberglass structure that kind of has this circular structure, too. And again, you can see the echinacea erupting out of that prairie drop seed that's just coming into bloom there. Uh, prairie drop seed is one of my favorite native grasses. Uh, I've been able to start growing it here in East Texas because uh, 
started liming the soil. And uh, Bill Thomas, who's the director at Chanticleer, described the fragrance of the seed heads. Interestingly, he said it smells like cilantro popcorn, uh, which is kind of an interesting description. Uh, going, coming back here to the U.S. again, sort of focusing a little bit more on Pete Outoff designs for a moment. The Lurie Garden was a place that uh, we got to visit a couple years ago on the PPA trip. So going there and again seeing you know this very famous American garden. Uh, one of the cool things about this is this is actually built in downtown Chicago on top of a parking garage. And so Roy DeBlick, who was involved in this design, said years ago that you know there's Baptisia on top of this. Uh, parking lot that will live for hundreds of years and the parking lots only you know age to last for about 35 years so what's fascinating is that you know some of our native plants that go into this landscape may actually end up outliving uh, the building on the south side of the garden is actually what we consider what we call a matrix design where what we have is a lower grassland type uh, ground cover layer, and then erupting out of that are echinacea. Uh, you can see further a little bit on the left side, there's some uh, rattlesnake master and compass plant that's starting to come into bloom there. But this Pete said uh, one time that you know the Lurie Garden was the first place that he really started experimenting around with this idea of matrix planting, where again, you're sort of blending these different plants together, and then you have this ground cover layer on top. So again, this Eryngium here, this rattlesnake master compass plant growing in the background as well too. I also love of how there's sort of this coherence that goes with the color. So how that rattlesnake master flower head, which by the way, if you don't have that, that's a great plant for pollinators. It mimics that gray color of the buildings behind as well too. And so, you know, we've got other natives, like for example, Leatris pycnostache, you know, we've got it growing right out here in front of our agriculture building. Uh, you've also got Echinacea in the back. You've got Euphorbia corollata, uh, the little uh, baby, uh, redneck baby's breath as sometimes it's called, you know, because it's this native airy white flower. But just to enjoy these beautiful and I love how the Leatrice just look like pipe cleaners that have sort of been bent and twisted different ways and again they're very interested in preserving insect life they are providing nesting habitat for insects and bees so what a lot of these gardens have started doing is instead of just coming in and mowing everything down they actually cut things back and leave stems so that some of these native bees and insects are able to come back out and live so again I talked earlier about how with gardening we've got to figure out a way that we can live together with other organisms you know that's going to be one of our challenges of uh, the next 50, 100 years. And then, of course, at nighttime to go out there and experience the garden. And this is, again, where we can talk about, you know, some of this complexity and coherence where, you know, you have sort of these structures of plants in the garden that are also resembling some of these sky rises and stuff behind this idea that, you know, you've got height in the garden against this city skyline and then the city skyline against that background sky, too, which is really, really touching. So, you know, I always think about, you know, can you look up at plants, you know, as you're walking through an area, can you perceive plants in different ways than you're typically used to. A uh, few other images from the UK going back there again. Super Bloom at the Tower of London was really, really incredible to see last year. They did a planting for the uh, Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee, again, 70 years. And so Karen and I got to go see that at the Tower of London, where basically they filled the whole Tower of London moat with wildflowers. And it was just spectacular to go see. When you first entered, it was interesting because they relied a little bit less on seed and more on plants that they had plugged in and planted. And then as you sort of round the corner, it became a little bit wilder. So we have more of a wildflower sowing here. You know, one of our natives that grows right here on the roadside, Coreopsis tinctoria, was mixed in here. They also had some sunflowers mixed in as well, too. And one of the challenges that you face with doing this style of planting is, is that, you know, once the super bloom, because uh, it was named after, of course, the super blooms that occur in California, once the super bloom comes and goes, you know, that's it. You know, you don't have anything else to look at. So if you look at the behind, uh, behind the pink and orange here, you'll see there's a lower area. And these lower areas intrigued me because what I noticed is, is that they were actually going into areas where the super bloom had finished and they were actually coming in and laying turf grass uh, style approach to doing plantings. And so that's what this is. This is like turf grass, you know, like you go and get sod at uh, a garden center. They had basically turf grass plants that they had brought in. You cut them two, three inches deep, you lay them on top, you take out what's finished and you put in what's there. And so seeing again, this different way of thinking about how we can do these wildflower plantings was really, really uh, touching and um, 
informational to think about. And then, of course, you don't have to go far abroad to see super blooms. Uh, recently in Nacogdoches, thanks to my friend Don Stover, we've been able to enjoy our own mini super bloom. This is uh, Phlox germundii and also uh, Rebecca starting to come into bloom here. So this is a partnership that they had with TxDOT where um, they basically came in. These was areas that were very hard to mow. And so they came in and did this wildflower mix. Again, one of the things about these wildflower mixes, is if you're going to do them, you oftentimes have to keep coming and do them every year. But not only did they plant these wildflowers that are more ruderal, uh, short-lived, they also have other things like, you know, narrow leaf mountain mint in here, uh, milkweed in here. So uh, these early wildflowers provide a nice cover for the other plants to get established. They're still going to be around, but it's going to be so nice to see these other plants start to kind of come in here and start erupting and growing up out of that. Of course, I saved one of the best for last, Grace Dix Dixter. Uh, we were able to go visit that last summer again when we were touring in the UK and got a chance to talk with Fergus Garrett, who's the head gardener there. Jeannie Price Nelson was talking about how she just got back from a trip uh, going and visiting Great Dixter. But this is their long border. If you don't know anything about Great Dixter, of course, Christopher Lloyd um, worked at the house, owned the house um, until his death around 2006, 2007. But the house dates back to the 1450s. Um, so it is a place place that has a rich history and rich biodiversity. Uh, this is my wife, Karen, taking a photograph of Inula. You know, we could grow Silphium here as a substitute, but Fergus is standing there holding it down for her um, so she can photograph it. But just to go to Dixter and again, see this complexity and coherence and legibility uh, just sort of applied here and sense of mystery with this place. It's just so touching to go see these rich landscapes that we can enjoy and perceive um, and just the creativity that goes, you know, more of a silver thing that you see here being applied in this landscape. And, you know, it doesn't have to be anything super detailed. You know, we can instead do topiary shapes out in grassland type habitats. And again, have those smoke trees that are starting to come into bloom there as well, too. Again, this interesting dyna dynamism of wild and airy meets harsh and coarse, you know, with the way that these shrubs have been topiaried. Uh, part of the garden, too, has been changed out. This is, used to be a, a garden for roses, and they changed it out to make a tropical garden. So Fergus was encouraging us to explore this area and wander, and you get in it. It's almost like you're lost. You know, it's not a large space, but you get in it, you feel like you're lost because there's all this bold foliage and tropical foliage that they've employed and used in this design. Another shot of the long border there, again, just showing some of the complexity and coherence that goes in with that. Again, repeating elements, but enough that keeps your attention going so that every five feet you have something different to look at. And then this amazed me. This is back behind the long border. This is actually his propagation bed. And so these are just plants that he just throws in the ground. He says they dig them up and they'll divide them. But just this idea of, you know, making stock beds where you have these plants growing, make them look beautiful, was just kind of a novel concept to me. And again, using one of our natives like Evening Primrose that, you know, loves to grow here along the roadsides, um, using that and employing that is just kind of so it self sows. But again, having this contrasting colors of yellows and purples um, and blues playing off of each other in that space. And then I mentioned too how he loves to do container plantings there. They're always talking about changing them out, making them look attractive. This is one that has more of a reddish pink theme that you see designed here. And then, you know, figs, uh, edibles, of course, are a prominent place at Dixter as well, too. You know, they've uh, Christopher Lloyd wrote a book on edibles and cooking in the garden years ago. But I think sometimes when we think about figs, you know, you can use some of these plants in interesting ways. I said earlier when I was talking about the Scudder Breedum, you know, you can espalier almost any plant. So you see this fig here that's sort of erupted up and growing up out of this space uh, and just trained against this wall. And they have to come in and frequently prune it. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, it's so interesting to have that texture there against that wall. And then, of course, here in the pond garden, they, of course, have uh, the hydrangeas and stuff just looking glorious and, you know, walking through the space and smelling the scents at night from the phloxes and stuff that are coming into bloom, which is very, very touching. I uh, just have a couple gardens wrapping up here. So, and these are some gardens that I saw that kind of have a little bit more of a funky approach. And so I just, I, it was, I had to share them because of the novel ideas that they had here. This is a Patage du Roy. This was the uh, 25 acre vegetable garden and orchard that was attached to the Palace of Versailles uh, in France. 
And so you go visit, and one of the things that you'll see there is just fascinating, interesting ways of espaliering plants. So these are peaches that are done in waves as you go up that wall on the left side. On the right side is actually a tree that's been espaliered into a chalice, and you wonder how in the world would they do that? And on the right side, or excuse me, on the left side, you see how. This is a fascinating approach called top working. What you do is you cut the top of a plant off, you graft in new cultivars, and then basically you start training up how you want it to be. So whether you want a chalice or a pyramidal triangular shaped tree, you know, that's up to you. Another place that I think does things really cool and novel, of course, is Plant Delights or Juniper Level Botanic Garden. This is, of course, their crevice garden that they have, or uh, they call this, instead of crushed concrete, they call it urbanite. And so this was just fascinating to kind of see how some of these gravel gardens are being approached and explored. Uh, so you can see here sort of a long shot of this. This is, again, just crushed concrete. And I think as we continue going forward into society, you know, instead of hauling things off of sites when we're doing construction, how can we keep it on site and make Make interesting places that plants can grow. And you, know, you can do it so that the majority of plants can grow in this type of habitat. This is one of my students, Jevin. Uh, he was interning in North Carolina a few years ago. So he and I met at uh, Juniper level whenever I was visiting one time. And if you look closely, what's growing in there is carnivorous plants. You know, carnivorous plants, they've, they've uh, put in liner so that that way the limestone doesn't seep in, but they've got carnivorous plants growing in this concrete uh, uh, crevice garden, which is just fascinating. Uh, one of the last places I want to share with you is Chadwick Farms, which again, thinking about how we can engage people with plants and connect people with plants, I thought this was fascinating. So this is uh, Chadwick Farms, of course, is a botanic garden associated with the Denver Botanic Garden. And what this is, is this is a dye garden. This is basically where they are teaching people about what different flowers can be used to produce what dyes. And so what's cool about this is, is that staked above every plant, there's a little piece of cloth where they have used that plant to dye uh, some cloth. On the right side, I love this, they made this ball where they actually dyed the wood three different colors. And so again, we've always got to be asking ourselves the question, how can we engage with people and teach them more about plants and help to share the wonder about plants? And so they actually had a display there where you can actually go and see the different plants that they've used for different dyes. So wrapping up, I want to ask you, you know, how can you become a traveling plants person? And it's not that hard. You can do it in your own backyard, going out and trying to see plants in new ways. You know, the, one of the last stories I'll leave you with is uh, a couple years ago, my friend Thomas Rayner, who co-wrote Planting in a Post-Wild World, messaged me and he said, hey, do you know where you can find Amsonia hubrichtii, uh, Arkansas Blue Star in the wild? And I was like, no but you know, I, I know some people who can help us find it. So Thomas and I went out exploring, looking for this plant in the wild. And so we found it here growing alongside of a ditch. We found it here growing al uh, along a creek in a barren. We've, uh, you can actually see a close-up of that photograph there where it's just growing there, right there, uh, where it oftentimes get floods and washed down. Another barren that we found this growing along, so this is a totally different site growing there along that space. We found it growing along the side of a river, and then we also found it growing alongside of a pebbly creek, and then we also found it growing alongside of a larger stream. And so the reason I'm sharing this with you is, is that when you go out and when you see plants, whether they're growing in the wild or growing in gardens, it changes your perception of them. It helps you better understand. And so what we saw is, you know, Amsonia, because we did this because Amsonia was struggling a rain garden near his house, and he wanted to better understand why it grew this way. So what we saw is, you know, Amsonia can tolerate really tough conditions. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it was perennial plant of the year back in, I think, in 2011. But, you know, it tolerates harsh conditions, but it's also used to drying down. And so one of the things you'll see about this is, is that the common theme is, is that, you know, each one of these plants was located next to water. My hypothesis is, is that that's probably how the seeds disperse uh, and grow is, is that they actually just float down the stream because other Amsonia species need water to be able to spread their seeds as well too. So the last thing I'm going to leave you with today, and Jenny Price, uh, uh, Nelson asked me to speak on this for just a moment, is this concept of sowing wonder. And so I, I'm going to challenge all of you who are on here today, share something you've learned today or soon with someone else, because it's going to take all of us sharing the love of horticulture to help get people more engaged with plants. You know, this is, this has no coherence, no legibility, well, maybe some legibility with the sidewalks, but no complexity. There's no mystery here. And this is a photograph that I took in Texas. And so we've got to ask ourselves the question, you know, how can we make our gardens more dynamic? You know, I would 
yeah, you know, why don't we do crushed concrete in here and plant something else in this space? But we've got to do this because, you know, there's challenges with pollinators. There's challenges with species being listed on the endangered species list. There's also challenges with the fact that people don't know what words are anymore. You know, I have a class of 120 students uh, every fall and spring, and consistently when I ask them, what is horticulture? Five to 10% of the hands in the class go up and they've never heard the word before. So it's on us. So, you know, whenever you think about sharing plant knowledge, just think about this. When seeds germinate, they have to take something in. So if you want that wonder to germinate in other people, they're going to have to take things in. So like, for example, basil seeds, when they get exposed to water, they start to swell up and form this gelatinous coat. It's a great first seed to get kids to sow. Camel latifolia share the wonder of plants with people like Camel latifolia. When a bee lands on there, the the stamens are actually sort of pistil loaded, so they actually bombard the the bumblebee with pollen and sort of pummel it a little bit. Or you know, use some of our native plants like Amsonia. You know, you, a lot of times it's really cool with kids. You can teach them to clip the end of an Amsonia seed off, soak it in water, and within 24, 48 hours, they'll start to see that seed emerge. So with that, I'm going to say, you know, think about how you can sow wonder. One of the ways I sow wonder in the world is, is that, of course, I have my newsletter that goes out every weekend, so uh, you can sign up for that. And then, of course, as was referenced at the very beginning, I, of course, have the Plantastic Podcast, where I interview once a month uh, a great horticulturist in the world to try to figure out how we can all become better gardeners and share that knowledge with everyone. So again, today, thank you for inviting me into your computers and your houses to share knowledge about you and to share some of the great gardens that I've seen around the world. And so that we can think about how we can use coherence and legibility and complexity and mystery. I hope that today has inspired you. And again, if you want to visit my website, there's a nice QR code down there that you can access. Um, and so with that, I'm going to say keep growing and I will take any questions you might have now. All right, Jared, um, this is Jenny here, and we had a question about your echinaceas. Um, yes. They wanted to know, do they actually all face east? Is that just, or is that the special? No, just the Tennesseeensis is the only one that really faces east. Uh, just the Tennesseeensis is the one that does that. And then um, the repeat blue Clematis that you mentioned that was so attractive. And uh, I think there might've been a question about a columbine. Ruguchi, Ruguchi is the cultivar name on that. So Ruguchi is the cultivar. So I'm just uh, um, trying to type the answer because it's a little bit weird to spell it. So R-O-O-G-U-C-H-I, -R -R Ruguchi. Any other um, questions? Well, I'm just going to uh, give you a, a, a rousing uh, round of applause and tell you that you, you've really opened my eyes to many different uh, ways to garden that we may not have thought of. Um, That's the goal. Uh, that is the goal. And um, I wonder if you might talk about how, when you went to these gardens, how it seems like everybody was so open to talk with you and and share and yeah, so that's one of the fascinating things about horticulture is I've had conversations with people who are in the business of plants, and they said, you know, one of the interesting things about um, horticulture is, you know, if you were running a, a different business, you know, maybe selling food or running a technology software business, you don't share ideas, you know, you don't share knowledge, but for whatever reason, Horticultures are different. You know, we're always so generous to share plants, to share knowledge, to share advice, uh, you know, to, to let other people know about our successes and failures. And that's just something that I've encountered. I think part of the reason why is, is that, you know, if we go into sort of our core beings, you know, we have this intimate connection with plants. And, you know, I, I think at some level, plants allow us to be more social. You know, horticulture is one of the first social ways that, you know, we humans experience, you know, there were trade routes from Asia to Europe. Uh, you know, when, when people, you know, cross the Bering land bridge, you know, they brought traditions and practices with them. And so, you know, there's, there's definitely this way that we've always interacted with the environment around us. And so I think at some level, we're playing off that concept of social currency. 
you know, where we're sharing knowledge about things that are innately around us. Maybe it's sort of this biophilia that, you know, we love the plants and we love sharing them. Um, so that that is one of the things that's amazing. Uh, you know, I have oftentimes been welcomed at gardens, you know, either reach out, email people beforehand, um, because people are always willing to share. And it could also be too that, you know, uh, we're so far and few between that anytime anybody wants to say, hey, I want to come visit, they're like, yes, please come. <laughs> you know, because we talk about how horticulture is, uh, you know, we're scattered, but it's a very small world. You know, a lot of people know a lot of people. So um, one more question. When you're out and about and you're seeing all these wonderful plants, um, how how should we evaluate the ones that we might want to grow here? So, for instance, at the new Delos in, at Sissinghurst, there are many plants that we could use in our parking uh, lot gardens here. How do we evaluate what to what's good and what's dangerous? That is also a really good question uh, to think about. So my advice is that if if you're trying new plants and evaluating them, what I like to do and the approach I like to take is I like to plant one of them or maybe two or three of them and see how they grow in that environment. You know, I can tell you here in East Texas, we uh, at my garden, we have a soil pH of 4.2 and that's getting toxic. You're, you're basically starting to break soil down. So it's releasing aluminum and it's getting toxic. And so, you know, when I first moved there, you know, I was planting stuff in the ground, things were dying because I thought it had the ability to tolerate it. I put some lime down and suddenly it thrived, you know, it just, it began to grow and thrive. And so, that's part of being a horticulturist is, you know, we were talking earlier about the mystery and complexity is, is that at some point in time, you're going to have to put it in the ground and try it. Now, as far as what you're talking about, as far as invasiveness, you know, that's something that you can recognize very quickly in a species. Uh, there's fortunately some guides out there that have been developed. Like I know Chicago Botanic Garden, they have a very active committee on, you know, when plants are brought into the Chicago Botanic Garden, they go through and test. They have to go through as a series of checks to make sure it's not invasive. So my advice is if you're doing this, find a space where you can kind of create a small trial area and then just keep a monitor on things and make sure that things are not going to become problematic. And the other thing too is, you know, we can't just be planting for, you know, the sake of planting. A lot of times, you know, if, if you do that, you just end up with, you know, a, a collection of ones, right? And so the question is that I'm always looking for, how does this fit into the story that I'm trying to tell throughout the year? So is there a gap in May or June that we need this plant to fill? Uh, is there a ground cover species we need? Is there a plant that we're trying to welcome in to attract because there's an endangered uh, butterfly or wasp or bee in the area? You know, those are kind of some of the design decisions you can make uh, in the background to help you with that. Um, Donna uh, has a question about flowering plants that are deer resistant. <laughs> yes. Um, well, that is the eternal challenge. And, you know, it's very, very hard to find uh, certain ones that are. My approach living in East Texas, because we have deer, we have boar, we have armadillos, uh, we have gophers, is I actually have invested in trying to isolate parts of my garden and strategically try to put things so that deer uh, are dissuaded from coming into the garden. So uh, in part of my garden, I have a double fence around it um, so that I'm able to protect where I grow my edibles and cut flowers and things like that. The outside of the fence is blackberries and the inside of the fence is going to be grapes and muscadines. Um, but I also have strategically put um, motion detector sprinklers in the garden. And it's it's very, for me, you know, I've been gardening now in this space for seven years and the deer damage, I've, I've only had deer issues once or twice. And I mean, they walk through other parts of the yard, but, but to me, my approach tends to be scare them away more. Uh, they're called orbit yard enforcers. And you, you basically have to change the batteries out once a year, but they're very, very effective at keeping animals away. And so they've, they've helped me with deer, they've helped me with boar, helped me with armadillos. Um, so that tends to be my, more my approach because it's very, very hard, um, especially with a lot of our native plants, uh, to discourage them from coming through and eating things. So um, the other thing, too, about the yard enforcers is you have to be careful. If you have a spouse and they walk through in front of the sprinkler and it's triggered to go <laughs> off, 
Uh, they will <laughs> scream. They will scream. <laughs> uh, the other thing too is just that when you're walking through the garden and you don't expect it to go off, you will get sprayed uh, very, very quickly. So, um, so that's just something else to keep in mind. But that's my approach for dealing with animals is exclusion and trying to come up with approaches to kind of scare them away. Uh, uh, Karen wants to know the name of the salix with the orangish stems, and so do I. It's a hybrid. It's Salix Flame, F-L-A-M-E, Salix Flame. And Maribeth wants to know, would a grit garden or a gravel garden work in the Dallas area? Is it too hot here or does the rock get too hot and dry? No, well, we have it. We have it here in Nacogdoches and, and we succeed with it. No, I don't think. I think the trick is to um, plant plants that are going to basically cover the ground. So the, the plants that we've had really good success with in our gravel garden, we've got Eryngium yuncifolium, rattlesnake master in there. So that's an upright. Uh, we all, Echinacea tennesseensis, Echinacea tennesseensis, Tennessee echinacea is actually an endangered, was an endangered species of Echinacea in Tennessee. is one of the first plants put on the endangered species list. And fortunately, one of the first plants taken off because they focused on trying to make the habitat better for it, um, reduce mowing, that type of approach. And so it's, it's safe, but it's also available in the trade, but that is one that is done stellar in our gravel gardens. Um, but the other than you know, some of these plants that look good, you know, like Baptisia will do well in there, asters will do well in there, like Aster Raiden's favorite. If, if you're worried about it getting too hot, my approach would be find species like um, rose muley. We have that in the garden, and the idea is, is that the grasses will cover the ground where the gravel is not able to get so hot. You know, it's, it's the same approach they use in the gravel garden at Chanticleer. Basically, if you have this grass ground cover layer, you're able to help deal with that excess heat. So no, and, and to, to further make that case, you know, I, I think if you're worried about being too hot in Dallas, you know, there's places in the Southwest where that's all they do. You mm -hmm. just gotta explore. So my advice would be, you know, look to some of these plants that are growing in barrens and other places where conditions are very harsh. Like I showed you earlier, the pictures of Amsonia hubrichtii, the Arkansas blue star, you know, the, the guy who was taking us on that trip said that, you know, come July, August, this place is baking out here. And, and it's really amazing that one of the things that I've learned is sometimes when we take a plant and we put it in our garden, we fertilize it in water and everything else, it dies. But then when we take that same plant and we put it in grit and gravel and we give it no fertilizer, it thrives. And it's truly amazing to see how some of these species. So is it possible in Dallas? Yes. Are you just going to have to experiment around with your plant palette? Yes. That um, sounds like a great idea for a new trial garden up at Myers Park in McKinney. Um, yeah. I've heard desert willows do great in that I, kind of environment. If, if you're looking for inspiration, I can help you. If you send me a message on uh, my website, I can help you out. There's actually a park when we visited with PPA years ago, south of Denver, and it is a no water park. Everything they plant there, they give it a little bit of water and then that's it. It's kind of uh, modeled after Beth Chateau's mm -hmm. uh, garden, uh, of course, in the UK, where she took a parking lot, paved over it with gravel, and then they plant stuff in there. They water it once at planting, and then they just let it go. Um, so uh, they just take some trialing. Nicole wants to know, if you've had any issues with your cone flowers, what can you do for pests and diseases like the mites and mosaic virus? Oh, I, Aster Yellows is horrible. I, yeah. I despise it. My approach is that I have come to recognize that Echinacea is what we classify as a ruderal, short-lived species. Right. They come up, they bloom for a few years, and then sometimes they actually peter out. And so my approach to Echinacea is a lot of times I collect seed at the end of the growing season. I sow a fresh batch of seed. That way, whenever one comes down with, if, if you're not familiar with Aster yellows, Aster yellows is a disease where once the Echinacea gets it, it causes the seed head to start turning uh, weird shapes. A lot of times there will be greening in the, in the rape florets, what we 
you know, kind of think of as petals on the outside, but there will be some disfiguration in the flower head. My strategy for that is just rip it out. I was so bad at the Chicago Botanic Garden years ago when they were doing their echinacea trial. They basically had to go through, scrap all the echinacea and start over. So my two favorite echinacea to grow are echinacea tenacensis. I've already talked about that. It comes true every year. You just collect seed off of it. It comes true, grows great for us here. We've got it growing. I've got it growing in my house in uh, sort of a sandy, more acidic soil. We've got it growing here in the gravel garden uh, here at the plantary. So it, it's very adaptable. The other one that I love is Echinacea purpurea Cleo Barnwell, which of course is a Greg Grant selection. It's one of the seediest echinaceas that he has ever found. And so it's not a, it's not one you can really find on the market. You just kind of have to be locally here in Texas. Some people will produce it, but it's a really good Echinacea purpurea seed strain. And I will say this too. Um, when we first planted the echinacea a couple years ago in the gravel garden, they were kind of petering along, much like things do in a gravel garden when you first plant them. But holy cow, echinacea love growing in grit. It has been amazing. They they we don't water that area ever, and they just keep sowing and spreading. And we're going to get to a point where we we'll probably have to start pulling some out. Um, but but it's really enjoyed that. So that's my strategy of dealing with echinacea. I. You know, I love the new hybrids that have all the reds and yellows and, and different colors in them, but I like plants that I can propagate and not have to worry about patent loss. And so for me, I just, a lot of times I'll go back to the species on that. So um, Carol's got a question about um, how do you go about choosing plants to make a dye garden? How, what's generally the process that they use? And that's, this is really a hot topic. Yeah, sure. And that's part of the reason I threw it in is because, you know, we're always trying to figure out ways to uh, engage people with plants. And so my advice was, would be just look at, um, look, I would, I would look for books. That's the first thing I would do. Um, the, the art, again, if you want to contact me on my website, um, I wrote a blog post uh, years ago about that dye garden. Uh, I remember like Coreopsis tinctoria was in there. You know, that's where a lot of our dyes used to come from. In fact, Baptisia australis, you know, our native wild indigo, part of the reason it's called wild indigo is because it was actually the first U.S. subsidized crop. Um, they actually subsidized it because they were trying to pay Southern farmers. Again, this is colonial times. So, you know, they were trying to pay or early revolutionary times, but they were basically paying it so they could try to subsidize that um, indigo because indigo was, of course, a very rare uh, uh, dye. And so they were trying to figure out a way that they can make it. So my advice is, you know, look for books that talk about dyes. But honestly, you know, if, if you watch some of these Instagram videos and stuff like people, you can almost use any plant that you want to to die unless it's toxic you know like you know i don't know wild hemlock you know don't use that yeah, one that would be a bad one like, i remember i remember i remember my mom and dad you know we would have school projects and stuff and we would go out and get black walnut and cook it down and make a dye out of that for you know dyeing cloth and stuff for a project back then so my advice is look for books on it again if you want to contact me on my website i can share that link with you and then i think that there might be more information out there on that chatwick farms about their dye garden. I could probably even put you in contact with uh, them to find out a good list of species that would work for you. We got a couple more questions. Well, and I'll also throw this too. Poke salad, you know, <laughs> that grows on the roadside. Like that's a great dye. You know I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, that, that, I mean, that's to me, that's, that's one of the easiest dying plants out there. So, you know, hey, we've, we've got that in Dallas, Fort Worth. So we, <laughs> we got it here too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. So uh, one person wanted to know the name of the gravel garden south of Denver that you mentioned. Uh, I will let me see if I can find the name of that. That may take there's me Denver point. Botanic has. Uh, yeah. Um, and um, I'll find it. Let okay. Me it. Uh, is there another question? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, for the grit, the gravel gardening, do you use limestone or something that won't act, impact the pH? Now, for you, you, it's probably helpful for you to have. Oh, that's true. So for us, we uh, my advice to you is to it would be to look for uh, locally sourced grit or gravel. You want it to be a little bit coarser, maybe like quarter half inch something along that line. Uh, so you want it to be not so fine that it will decompose because the minute you start getting fines in it, you're going to start running into issues with uh, having 
soil being made essentially that weeds can start growing in and that's a problem so a lot of times you want to try to manage the number of fines um, that are in that but not be so large that it looks like you know you just got you know like we see sometimes that you know the fast food restaurants they just done like the lava rock um, out there so a lot of times your uh, my advice would be go to local rock yards and talk to them, find out if they have coarse stuff. Now, I have not used limestone. However, if you want to look up, uh, let's see, if you want to look up wild by design, W-I-L-D space B-Y space D-E-S-I-G-N uh, is run by one of my friends up in Canada. His name's Ben. And what Ben has been doing is uh, he actually got a grant to grind up concrete and mix it in with rock and basically grow plants in that in that artificial substrate and so he has done the trial at a local school the basically they just had a school oh, i saw that that's really yeah, fascinating. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so really and good. i believe and and so if you go on if you look at wild by design ben um you go on and look him up uh and he's on instagram too his handle is wild by design but if you go on and look him up, uh, he does have the plant list on his website where basically you can go on there and read about um, how those trials go. So my advice is just basically look for, you know, your local local rocks and gravels that have a certain size. Um, try to try to make sure there's not a lot of fines in it. Um, you also got to watch, too, if you go to these gravel yards, because we go to a local one where they do paving. So sometimes the gravel might have tar added to it. So you just got to watch for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a, a lot of comments of appreciation and uh, oh, just you. sheer delight with your talk today, um, you. Jared. So I want to thank you for being with us. And then I'm going to introduce Baron uh, back to say a few more words. Yeah. And I'll say really quickly too about the gravel garden south of Denver. Oh, I'm right, gonna, right. Let's see if I can't find that real quick. Um, and then I can maybe come back on in just a second to try to share that. Okay. okay right. And we can uh, we can also include it in our follow-up email. That we'll we may get questions that will come in after uh, our presentation and we'll make sure that we get everybody answers. Baron, are you there? I am here. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jared. Thank you so much for your, for this outstanding presentation. It was oh, both welcome. fun. It was it both form, uh, fun and informative, uh, and for allowing us a means to share in the sights from your many journeys. Uh, and for the participants, we want to thank you for sharing part of your day with us. As a reminder, we will be sending you the link that will let you review Jared's program at your leisure. And don't forget to fill out the and submit your survey. Uh, you, we hope that all, all of you will join us for the remaining events in our series on July the 19th. We will have a presentation from nationally known brilliant garden writer and speaker, Marianne Wilburn, who will discuss tropical plants and how to love them. And then on August the 23rd, the world famous entomologist and best-selling author, Dr. Doug Tellamy, author of Nature's Best Hope, will be our featured speaker. His presentation will be Homegrown National Park. And again, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, during this brutal Texas heat, please try to stay cool. Always wear a hat and definitely stay hydrated. Be safe and we will see you next time. Bye all. <laughs>